1994, an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.7 struck Los Angeles, California. The Northridge earthquake cut off highways and destroyed more than 14,000 structures and houses. The financial loss was estimated to be more than $30 billion. This is Bel Air, California, an exclusive residential area in the western suburbs of Los Angeles. The damage of the Northridge earthquake was widespread and affected this affluent suburban area. Bel Air Presbyterian Church was no exception. The pipe organ, a symbol of the church, was severely damaged. Most of the pipes were salvaged, but the equipment that controlled the pipes and organ console was completely destroyed. People were stunned by the loss of the organ. The earthquake, considered to be an act of God, took away the pipe organ from the church. However, the people who loved the organ decided to take this opportunity to reconstruct it using a very new method. The history of the pipe organ dates back more than 2,000 years. The origin of the pipe organ is attributed to the pan pipes referred to in Greek mythology. In other words, an organ is a type of flute and has the same structure as a wind instrument. Throughout its long history, organs have had unusual types of construction. This is the oldest organ, a water organ, or hydraulis. The vase was partially filled with water, and the sound was made from the hydraulic pressure, which sent air from the vase to a row of pipes. Parts of a water organ were excavated from the ruins of ancient Greece. The shape and sound of the water organ was reproduced using these parts. However, the most popular organ was the bellow-fed organ. The water organ method of sending air by hydraulic pressure was not developed further. During the age of the Roman Empire, organs built using the latest technology were considered dignified musical instruments and were used at celebrations and rituals. The organ was united with the structure of the Christian church and played a large role in deepening the relationship between the church and the people. The tone of the organ drew people into a world of devout prayers. Soon, organs became more than ecclesiastical instruments. During the Renaissance of the Middle Ages, a high level of organ music flourished, reaching its greatest popularity in the Baroque era. The organ was then considered the king of musical instruments. Johann Sebastian Bach is famous worldwide as a great musician who helped contribute to the musical brilliance of that era. The organ has been loved by many people of all ages. The organ's basic operation remains substantially unchanged from the 18th century. The wind from the wind supply is pressurized into a box called the wind chest. The small partitioned box on top of the chest 
is called the channel or groove. There is one channel for each key. The organist chooses a sound by drawing a stop knob to move the slider so that air travels only to the pipes that he selects. Pressing a key causes the valve or pallet for that key to open, allowing air in the wind chest to travel along the respective channel through the slider hole and into the pipe, thereby making a sound. There are flue pipes that have the same structures as a pipe and a reed pipe and create sounds by vibrating a reed, like the harmonica. This is how the organ produces music. Why then has the organ fascinated people for over 2,000 years? The charm of the organ is said to be in its sustainability of sound, colorful tones, and its reverberation, all of which are unique characteristics of the organ. For example, in a piano, a note gradually fades out while the key is being pressed, but in an organ, the note continues to sound as long as the key is held down. This sustainable sound creates a world of sound unique to the organ. The organ also produces brilliant tones. One organ can produce various complex tones comparable to an orchestra. This is why the organ is called the king of musical instruments. Reverberation is also one of the main characteristics of the organ. The organ has evolved with church music. The organ's special effects were realized by designing the organ and a building as one unit. As craftsmen made continuous efforts to produce brilliant tones, the organ became larger and larger. To play the complex organ well, the composer and organist were called upon to utilize all their talents and abilities. The evolution of both the technology and the production of sound had a multiple effect on the development of the organ. This, in turn, resulted in a pursuit of a larger audience and organs were installed in large-scale concert halls. On the other hand, there were craftsmen who tried to create smaller organs for use by the general public. However, it took generations for this to be realized. The rapid technological developments during the late 19th century through the 20th century provided an impetus to the organ engineers. By developing a blower using motors, stops made by electromagnets, and metalworking technology, engineers endeavored to realize their dream of creating a compact organ that would be more accessible to the general public. Before long, theater organs were developed, and they became enormously popular. They were used to accompany silent films. Organs, by adopting the latest technology of each age, rapidly became popular musical instruments. The movie boom made theater organs widely popular. The theater organ was renowned for its unique tonal quality. Even today, theater organs are still very popular. Many of them are preserved in museums and private collections and maintained in a state where they can be played at any time and enjoyed by today's audiences. Innovations developed theater organs and home organs. But it was Lawrence Hammond who brought about a turning point in the history of the organ. Lawrence Hammond was an inventor and the president of Hammond Clock Company. He always wanted to make use of his strong technical knowledge to create a new musical instrument that could reproduce the tonality of the pipe organ. In 1934, he succeeded in creating the first Hammond organ.
The Hammond organ produced sound by amplifying subtle changes in voltage generated by rotating a tone wheel generator, which is a steel disc set close to a magnet and coil assembly. The indentations on the tone wheel are in proportion to the pitch of a particular tone. This is the drawing of the organ that Mr. Hammond drew when he applied for a patent. This organ uses something you would never expect to be found in a musical instrument, a crank, which was an indispensable tool for starting a car engine in those days. In other words, Hammond used the crankshaft to start the rotation of the tone wheel generator in his prototype, just as a hand crank was used in starting an early automobile. This first Hammond organ was very expensive, costing about three times as much as a car in those days. It was Henry Ford, the car king, who bought the first Hammond organ. Ford was very interested in Hammond's inventions and sent engineers to examine the prototype organ. However, the Federal Trade Commission of the United States ordered a ban on using the name organ for this innovative musical instrument. Later, after listening and comparing the sound to that of a traditional pipe organ, the FTC decided to allow the use of the name Hammond organ. This name gradually became known worldwide. Meanwhile, an engineer who loved organs as much as Hammond helped to make the popularity of the Hammond organ grow by leaps and bounds. In 1940, Don Leslie invented a speaker system that imitated the effect of the pipe organ. His epoch-making invention changed the conventional approach towards sound and space. We have succeeded in interviewing this great inventor. So the task was to not only make the, the tones sound like a pipe organ, but also make the room sound like a big pipe organ. And so that involved many things. The unique speaker system developed by Leslie projects sound in all directions by using two motors, one for rotating a horn speaker cone and one for rotating a larger bass speaker. And it so happens that uh, 50 years ago, I guess it was, that I developed a system that was quite different than anyone else's at the time. And I haven't ever seen anyone do it just the way I did it even, yeah. even today. Leslie's ideas were very simple. How do pipe organs push sound through passing air? He analyzed the mechanism and thought that if he made a speaker with the same conditions as the pipe organ, then the sound of the pipe would be no different from the sound of the speaker. This inspiration created the Leslie speaker. This type of organ developed by Hammond and Leslie excited many musicians, including Jimmy Smith. They started to use the Hammond organ in their performances.
the passions of the performers stimulated the craftsman spirit of the engineers. They, in turn, created instruments that inspired the creativity of the performers. The organ has made use of each era's technological improvements. Only 60-some years have passed since the creation of the electric organ, but it has made rapid progress. The driving force was the improvement and progress of digital technology. Releasing sound through speakers was once considered to be a handicap to the electronic organ, but today, the electronic organ is considered a musical instrument with endless possibilities. The personal computer has been the foundation of this era. As such, the activities of Alan Kay, one of the influential developers of the personal computer, are being watched with keen interest. He grew up listening to the pipe organ and now has a small concert hall in his house for his pipe organ. In order to realize a better sound, he has tried developing a reverb enhancement system using modern digital technology. Baroque organs like this one usually are done in wooden uh, churches rather than uh, stone buildings and so they generally have a shorter amount of uh, reverb that allows you to hear the notes in the counterpoint as written by Bach or, or Buxtehude. One of the best uh, reverbs for Baroque organ is one that is very long but very, very, uh, it's a small room so we got about two and a half seconds and ideally you'd like to have three or four, but more importantly is when we have concerts here, just 40 or 50 people in this room can take away most of the reverb, and then uh, the audience doesn't have the same experience that I do when I'm, when I'm practicing alone. And so, well, I think that the, the, you know, certainly if an organ is in a big auditorium that has carpets, um, uh, upholstered chairs and a lot of people and it wasn't made for acoustics. I think it's very important um, to have some sort of uh, uh, reverb assistance. Organists with high sensitivity bring out the richness of the organ to the fullest. Hector Oliveira, a world-famous pipe organist who also plays the electronic organ, is one such artist. If I am playing a, a symphonic uh, transcription, like William Tell or Respighi, The Pine of Rome, 
uh, I am actually doing the job of 70 musicians. And the key to it is not just the technique, but it's how to feel and breathe every instrument of the orchestra. This is the score of the William Tell Overture, which includes all the orchestral parts. By himself, Hector is using the different functions of the organ to make the sounds of the orchestra. Through a continual process of trial and error, he is able to arrange all of the music for both manuals and pedals of the organ. For example, he is now playing four parts simultaneously. First of all, I have to hold these notes that the button is holding automatically. So I can play the piccolo, do the strings on the upper, and the pedal timpani roll, so all together like this. I don't have no names for anybody, but some people believe then, well, you have to play Bach in the harpsichord, you have to play Bach in a pipe organ. Well, I have heard great renditions of Johann Sebastian Bach in an accordion. Bach never wrote for the accordion. I have heard magnificent renditions of Debussy on synthesizer, but Debussy never knew a synthesizer. And so here we are uh, in this new millennium. And uh, I think that those people should maybe not change their mind, but at least open their way of thinking and realizing that the electronic instrument, an electronic organ, is just another means of making music. And that is the most important part. This is the Bel Air Presbyterian Church, which was affected by the Northridge earthquake. The latest digital technology has had a positive impact on the repair of their pipe organ. So we just took a, a fresh look at everything and wanted very much, however, to, to include the pipes in whatever we did, both from, a, from an aesthetic standpoint and from a, a sound standpoint. The organ could have been restored if they had replaced all the parts that were damaged by the earthquake. However, the congregation determined that they would not simply replace the organ, but instead install a newer, better, larger organ that meets the needs of a new era. After a heated debate, the congregation agreed that the sound had to surpass the tonal integrity of the traditional organ. The organ had to match the aesthetics of the church. They put their efforts in pursuit of new possibilities for the church and organ music. And we wanted something that, that if this church decided it wanted to go to more contemporary types of music, we wanted an instrument that could, 
could uh, add to that rather than be replaced by it. They reached a conclusion to repair the damaged pipes and to combine the pipes with high-quality digital voices. They also chose to add digital orchestral and sound effects. Now, the original console for the Casavant was over here where you see the white wall space. That was completely destroyed because the, not because of the earthquake, but because the sprinkler system came off and ruined all of the wooden action parts that are in here. We are looking at the four-manual Rogers console that was installed in the rebuild. Digital voices were newly added to the existing 48 stops, creating a grand total of 151 stops. The result is a broader, richer expression of organ sound. The congregation used pipes that were salvaged from the earthquake. For the new digital voices and sounds, new speaker systems were installed and carefully placed throughout the pipe chambers and the church sanctuary. We are now in uh, what used to be the swell organ. New parts were made for those that were totally destroyed, such as the box for swell pipes and the four manual organ console itself. The part that controls the sound of the pipes was replaced by a digital device. The piece that took up so much space in the past has now been replaced by a small digital part. But what really surprised and pleased the congregation most of all was the beauty of the final song. Combining the pipe salvaged from the precious organ with digital technology, the timbre of the new organ has proved to be a pleasant surprise to the congregation. And it's, a, it's an unbelievable combination of digital and pipe. I'm amazed. That I thought that I would be able to tell. I've studied organ many years in my life, and I had not the vaguest idea of what is digital and what is pipe. I cannot begin to tell the difference. It's a wonderful, wonderful instrument. And, uh, we began hearing organs yeah. that were hybrid organs and realized that we could have a much larger organ yeah. with many more capabilities of sound. By doing this, it was a wonderful decision. The solemn resonance of the combination organ born in Bel Air. The charm of the organ has remained strong through 2,000 years of history. It now has numerous possibilities which result from the integration of digital technology. Today, the organ, equipped with the latest technology to succeed its traditions, displays even more richness as the king of instruments. For all music lovers.
out in this wide world alone. No have I for to borrow. I'm just trying to make heaven city called heaven and I started to make it
ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don Lewis. Whoa.
Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Yuri Tachibana. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tony Fenelon.
Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Rosemary Bailey.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dan Miller.